Cardano. Um, I want to read. I want to read this thing you wrote. It was in December 2017. I want to get your thoughts on it. Sure. You you were writing about the the progress of Cardano, which was you know in December 2017, and you said this. You said, "I've never been here for the short term. It's always been the dream of finding a way to get financial services to the three billion people who don't have them using technology that was only a dream a generation ago." And I think we're making great progress here. So that was like shortly after the buyer and error, I guess, launched, right? Right. And you were you you mentioned you're making great progress. Now here we are, like oh, a little over four years. Um, I want to ask you now, how is it progressing? Ah, well, you know, let's look at what we accomplished. Um, we went from a, a static and federated system uh, that didn't have smart contracts, uh, that had a very small community, that would had a very little liquidity. Uh, to uh, an ecosystem in the top 10 with you know, over 100 exchanges, 2 million people, 130 dApps being built, 2 million assets issued on it. We've gone from the Byron era to the Shelley era to the Gogan era successfully. We've never had a major downtime in the network history. Uh, hundreds of billions of dollars of value have been moved in the year 2021. Uh, and we also have written 130 academic papers. We defined the entire science of proof of stake, uh, and we learned an enormous amount along the way about new development models, like, for example, extended UTXO, which is the only way, in my view, to bring smart contracts to Bitcoin, and it enables things like Mithril and uh, Hydra in short order. Uh, so I think a lot's been accomplished, and when people look back at all of that, they'd say, okay, you know, if somebody told you we'd achieve all of that in a four-year period, you know, would you take that deal? They say, of course. And they'd say, you're crazy to see that kind of growth and that kind of systematic effort and, and so forth. But what they do is they get so caught on the narrow and say, well, you know, smart contracts were supposed to be here or decentralization is supposed to be here. We had to rewrite the software three times. There were major changes in architecture and vendors. There were approaches that were taken that didn't work out. There are course delays. Well, you know, Vitalik said that in 2015, he said Ethereum uh, 2 was going to come out 2018. Worst case scenario, you know, and, you know, it's 2022. He's saying it may be 2025. You know, so does that mean everything Ethereum's ever done and achieved is, uh, is bad? No, it's just, it's just the nature of the game. And there's things you learn along the way. In some cases, you're overly optimistic. Um, there were product and project management methodologies we were following that, we thought would properly estimate things. Turned out they were wrong. People behind that aren't here anymore. We have completely different ways of running product and project management. We're far more accurate. When we have delays, they're usually in the months or weeks, not in the years in these types of things, which means we're converging. Now, what's nice, though, is one thing that's never been wavering has been the product market fit, and we've made enormous project progress there. I'll get into that in a second. But then also... The, the clarity that the science has brought us. We don't sit around wondering, gosh, how do we scale? You know, gosh, how do we make this secure? Gosh, how do we know this is going to work? We know, we already know. We have enormous advantages in our network stack design, enormous advantages in our consensus protocol design. We know the limitations of the system and the robustness of it. So it's not a matter of if, but simply how long will it take to roll out? So when we look at things like pipelining import endorsers, you have all these people running around, dag this, dag that, dag this, third generation this, super high TPS. Well, Input Adorsers effectively does that for you. And that was something we came up with in 2016. And we had a follow-up paper in 2018, Parallel Chains. Both went through peer review. So we know the science is settled. We have a really good understanding of it. We know how to build it. So, and we know that we're now in a position where it can be built because the foundations are mature enough to be able to roll these types of things out. So there are very few projects in this space that have so much clarity about how to put all the pieces together from how to get great user experience and like clients to how to do microtransactions to how to accelerate the base ledger. And a lot of people say, well, you're just taking Charles's word for it. It's like, well, no, we wrote 130 papers and there's an army of engineers and all these other things. We did all the work up front. And if we hadn't done that, then it would be just like Vitalik with his prognostications about, uh, you know, Ethereum 2 and Casper, where they keep doing it until they run into a roadblock, then they have to throw it all away and keep doing it until they run into a roadblock and throw it all away. We don't quite run into that. So I think this year is going to be our most productive year. And, you know, people on Twitter, they like putting up that quote where I made a prediction about the amount of dApps 
and assets. Well, I was wrong in both directions. I was under optimistic about assets. There's 2 million assets that have been issued on <laughs> Cardano. I was overly optimistic on the amount of dApps, but to be fair, we have 130 under construction. And we're in the infancy of Plutus, and we haven't even turned on all the Ethereum interoperability. So if you look at that projection and you project it out the year, if that keeps going with Catalyst support, uh, we're probably going to be right in that projection. All right, it was raw off by about a year. Does that materially change the protocol? Does that materially change the science? Does that materially change the use of utility? And then on to Africa, you know, we did the Africa tour last year. We went South Africa and Burundi and Zanzibar and Ethiopia and Kenya and Egypt. And we put ourselves in a great position over the last four years to actually start realizing what I was talking about, the TED Talk in 2014. There has been an enduring consistency in our messaging, vision, and philosophy about this project. We've never wavered once. We said, three billion people, let's go find them, let's get them in. And we have a beautiful approach to do that. We've brought millions on board with PRISM, B2B to C acquisitions. We have great partners on the ground that we're actively working with in Africa, nation states we're working with. So there's an inevitability that we get a shot at the vision of changing the lives of billions of people as an ecosystem. And we know the technology is fit for purpose because we built it that way. Everything from the metadata standards to the prison-based identity standards to how we approach scale, how we approach participation. The other thing is the people in the ecosystem care about the mission. You know, you think about growth, you have to ask yourself, who are you inviting into your house? If you get people in, the only thing they care about is making money, speed, and cost. Then if you go to them and say, hey, let's hyper-centralize the system and give Amazon total control, and you'll save 25%, they'll be like, where do we sign up? We love money. So you have to be really careful with how you grow and how you indoctrinate the philosophy of the system, just like Bitcoin was. No one was money motivated in the early days of Bitcoin because there was no money to make. You know, Bitcoin was worthless. There were StarCraft tournaments where your fifth prize, your consolation prize was 25 Bitcoin. Your first prize was $100. I mean, if you're, ah, I got these worthless Bitcoin things. What the hell are those, right? But it grew into this Goliath because it was born of principles. And so when you look at your initial population, you have to say, where do they come from? What's your churn rate? What are your growth factors? And one of the things that people cannot deny is the strength of the Cardano community the passion of that community, the philosophy, the philosophical purity of that community, and the fact that most people here just want to do the right thing and they want to change the world. And they're comfortable with the idea that they're not a passive, but rather an active participant there. We have this saying in Cardano, grab a shovel, get it done, go out there, plant some trees. Uh, and we see the stake pool operators doing clean water projects. We see people doing healthcare projects, charity projects. Some are faith-based. Some are philosophy. Some are setting up NGOs. There's a SPO down in South America that's feeding children in Argentina. Everybody is finding something to do, some way to help, and use this system to do so. And as the tooling and capability of the system grows, that's only going to increase. And people are participating in droves with Catalyst. We have the largest decentralized organization in the world running the distribution of funds for, uh, for the treasury of Cardano. Every round participation metrics go up, the amount of funded ventures go up, we're over 300, and those will bear fruit in their own right and lay the lens for a thousand flowers. So I feel very strong. I feel we're in a very strong position. I think we've made enormous progress, especially when you zoom out a little bit and you look at where we were at and how weak we were to how strong we are now and how fast it's all coming together. And the fact that every aspect is covered by some paper or piece of technology that we know works. And it's just an ma inevitable matter of getting all those pieces together. And if winning means you have to compromise on quality and have $10.5 billion a hacks a year and not care about people and surrender to centralization or reset the network anytime it breaks manually, uh, I don't want to win. You know, I'd, I'd much rather lose with some integrity. And frankly, I think it's neither. I think we're going to win with integrity because that's ultimately what crypto is all about. That's the point of crypto is the principles of it, or, or else you're just building another legacy system and trading, you know, Goldman Sachs for Ethereum or Goldman Sachs for a new coin or something like that. What the hell's the point? It makes no sense.